So today I'm going to talk about the focused mind and what that creates. Uh, you have a choice, good or evil. With evil, you're pursued with, by fear and doubt and guilt and quitting. With good, you're, you pursue joy and hope, future and stamina. You have a God-given gift of creating the world around you. Everybody can dream and plan and then act. We can all point our mind in any direction that we choose. If you turn to Proverbs 10, verse 24, and hold your finger there. Proverbs 10, 24, it reads, The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desires of the righteous shall be granted. So God's showing us that he set in motion a system in creation that mirrors his own character traits. It guides the rebellious back towards God, and it gives hope, or it reinforces the hopeful not to quit. It's like the law of gravity, or a, it spins like a top. You know, by directing your mind, you're able to choose to take responsibility in your life, you know, one that matches your good goals. Not directing your mind like a jellyfish, you go nowhere. And you have no value to you or to God. And this is not calling upon the spirits or lighting incense and meditating to the universe. And this is not name it and claim it prayer circles. It's asking, what is something that I could do that I what is something that I would do, that I could do, and then do it? And if you do that 10,000 times, you'll be living in a different world. In contrast, let's look, let's look at the Israelites leaving Egypt. In Exodus 14, verses 11 and 12, we'll read the, you're reading here that, the Israelites are arguing with Moses on how they foresaw the whole plan collapsing before they even left slavery behind. Well, this is another fine mess you've gotten us into, Moses. Later in Numbers 14.22, God counts ten occasions of doubt from them. It never quit. The murmuring against God never quit. And later in chapter 14, in verse 27 through 30, there's nothing that God can work with here. And God lets the natural consequences of their focused mind that's creating fear create the world that they live in, to wander aimlessly in the wilderness and drop dead after 40 years and never enter the, pro the promised land. There is one exception, Joshua and Caleb, who never wavered in their locked onto the promise of God. They acted in obedience, in competence, allegiance, and assurance. In the book of Daniel, chapter 6, in the first 12 verses, you read the story of Daniel's rise into the government because of his following of God. He rises to the top, and his co-workers in jealousy conspire to temporarily ban, temporarily ban his sincerely held religious beliefs. 
and put it under the penalty of the pain of death by lions. Daniel did not focus on the worst case happening to him. There was no panic. To him, nothing should change. He probably waved to them across the balcony as he went down to pray. And they probably waved back to him as he walked into the lion's den. But the next morning he walks out and justice is swift in the kingdom. The king's guard, they bust up the after hours party goers celebrating their, their cunning victory only to become the punchline in that story. This encapsulates Daniel with a lifetime of focus on God's ways. In the book of Job, it is revealed that he is a man beyond reproach, and he's actually called out by God to Satan. It's like, go ahead, take your best shot. And you can take this as a cautionary view. You know, if you've been doing this walk with God for a certain amount of time, God can show you where you have room for improvement. If you're in Job 1, verse 5, you know, Job is, has dedicated time for the sake of his family beyond the physical necessities and the special comforts of wealth. And he's made sacrifices on the possibility that his children may have secretly turned against God. Is he being proactive? Is he a helicopter parent? Is he paranoid? Mm. Things are so good, don't let anything screw it up. These are justifiable fears? Probably. In Job 3, verse 25, this is after Satan strikes. There's a period of reflection with Job. And Job states that what he feared the most has happened. And what he was afraid of has happened. Is, is this God saying, this is God saying to us to be careful what we focus our mind on. It is possible to move the world to fit that view. We are susceptible to following that path of least resistance into fear. It's focusing on the darkness instead of the light. It's writing a script. If we're not careful, we could become, become an author writing the script of our life. Nothing ever goes right for me. Or if something's going to go wrong, that's probably going to happen to me. I cringe inside just repeating those beliefs that I used to carry around. But these are negative outlooks on life. And if you do them long enough, it is all that you'll expect to see in life. And if you do it over the course of a lifetime, you'll actually end up fighting against good coming into your life because it doesn't match your created free will view of the life that you should have. So what are you listening to? Not every thought that ricochets through your brain originates from within you. We battle against Satan. And he suggests and weaves or just pile drives this poisonous thoughts into our mind. And Satan holds sway over the whole world but we are to be developing this spiritual clarity to measure by God's standard what is good and what is evil. We have God's Holy Spirit. We are to learn the, an awareness of his devices, his patterns, and his camouflage. And this is not positive mental attitude conquers all, although it does help to have a good attitude. 
But Satan would devour us without God's protections or limits. So why do we as humans have a tendency to focus on the worst case happening? Is it a virtue to imagine the wreckage that you can crawl out of? Is it a measure of one's inner strength? Or is it an easy out registering for how weak you are for martyrdom? In my own experience and casual study of human behavior, I will submit that holding on to guilt and shame from one's own sins will drive an individual to anticipate a life of punishment and despair. It is that psychological penalty of self-will that was spoken of in Proverbs 10, 25, maybe 26, maybe. I spoke about it, I had mentioned earlier. The thought of following one's own free will, that breaking of innocence, and that self-betrayal by your one's own passions. All of this, Satan will turn against you. And welcome to the club. You've missed the mark, you sinners. You should feel bad. Briefly. But it's to cause change and to repent. That's okay. It's part of the plan in gaining wisdom. Dust yourself off. Get back up. Keep trying. If you break... If you turn to, uh, if you note Hebrews 9.26, you're breaking into a thought. It's Hebrews 9.26. That God knew the likelihood was high that man would fall. And the Father and the Son, they dreamed, they made a plan, and they acted to redeem mankind from the eternal death. Christ lived as a man under, God's, under God the Father's authority and lived a perfect life. He was crucified as a pure sacrifice to pay mankind's sin debt in full. Breaking into another thought, we see in 1 John 3, verse 5, the thought that when we repent and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and become baptized, our sins are struck from the record by Christ's shed blood. And during the spring holy days, Passover is a recommitment to have Christ in us and have our sins washed away. And by this process, and by this love for us, we can let go of our failings and move forward in life with hope. You'll see that message in 1 John chapter 3 throughout that chapter. This week you have a homework assignment. That's to read through Proverbs 3. And you're going to find these ideas of obedience, confidence, allegiance, and assurance. You can pull out these gold nuggets. And in this, God shows you, shows you if you are obedient to his ways, it leads to confidence and moving forward in life. To maintain momentum with God, it requires allegiance to his ways. By doing this, you will have assurance of an ending better than your beginning. That's God encouraging you to be a finisher. In conclusion, if you turn to Philippians 4, verse 7 through 8. Look, Tina, I got my Bible. Uh, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus. Finally, Brethren, 
Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. I always want to follow that up with, won't you be my neighbor? But if that sounds too trite, you can stuff a lot of positive masculine traits into that misperceived milk toast. Your mind has the power to create. The choice is yours. Happy Sabbath.